Gobin one. And uh, hi, I'm Ian Robert Jones, and you're listening to the, or watching, I guess, the Arts BC Facebook Live, sponsored by the 2018 Arts BC Conference. This year's conference is taking place at the Nikkei Cultural Centre in Burnaby, and that takes place between May 10th and 12th. And this year's theme is Engagement in a New Arts Area, and today we've got Nicola Reddington to talk about Engagement in a New Arts Era. Nicola, Hello. welcome to the Thank show. Me, I really appreciate this opportunity. <laughs> that's Friday, great. Cool. Great way to end the week. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Well, people don't realize what technical difficulties there we're having. So <laughs> this really is an opportunity, isn't it? It is. It's a great opportunity to connect. All right. So, so um, tell us a little bit about yourself to begin with. Uh, we'll get to who you are and what you do. But tell us about Nicola Reddington a little bit. Oh, how long? How far should I go back? I grew up in Edmonton. I was born and raised in Edmonton. Uh, uh, British immigrants, they came, for, were the first generation in Canada, um, and I went to university at Queen's University, and I studied drama and theatre, uh, and I loved scene painting and costume design at the time, And but I, I realized I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I, was, I loved it, but I wasn't, it didn't come easily to me, um, and I found my way um, fully into the Grant McEwen uh, University Program in Arts and and I found my happy place and to the art gallery and uh, fell in love with it. And um, from there, in the different organizations in uh, Edmonton, I eventually moved out to the West Coast, which I loved, um, and, and worked at the Shabal Center at the city of Burnaby. And then um, my husband got a job out here on Vancouver Island in Victoria, and it's been a great move for us, and I'm now at the city of Victoria, uh, and even happier. I, I just feel really fortunate to be able to, you know, sort of be in this position today to, to talk to people and um, work with the community here in Victoria, and uh, yeah, so yeah, in the arts, I wish I could have made it on stage or even behind the stage, but just didn't work out, but at least I'm still connected in some way to the arts community. And um, like the creative people. It's me in a nutshell. That's me in seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we lost a little bit of the last part, but basically you're saying that, yeah, you're still connected to the arts community and um, you're a really big part of the arts community, actually. Let's not uh, understate that too much. Basically, uh, you're the senior cultural planner for arts, culture and events with the city of Victoria. So tell us a little bit about what you do there. What, what is that job? Well, it's really evolved. When I started in 2009, we were part of the Parks and Recreation Department. So we were a, a small portion portion of some recreation department and my job there was really managing our civic square and all the programming and event permitting side we I, I there was a grant program for festivals and events so I helped manage that for some time I also started working in the literary arts with our poet laureate and youth poet laureate positions uh, and, and also public art and the, and the community development side um, it had actually been born out of community development uh, and then they changed the, the title to culture it was quite interesting that evolution and then uh, 2015, we moved under the deputy city manager's office, uh, more of an economic development um, side of the organization of the city of Victoria, and we now have a standalone arts, culture, and events office, which is fabulous. And through that uh, transition, I sort of moved up in terms of a, a more uh, senior management level role, um, and now uh, is sort of working through the uh, cultural plan, cultural policy portfolio. I've now working in cultural infrastructure um, and grants and all sorts and everything in between and, and working with a great staff team here who also manage all of our special events and public art, um, our uh, music strategy that's coming on, uh, online uh, pretty soon in terms of a project. So there's lots going on here in Victoria and we, we are a small but mighty team here and uh, uh, we, yeah, we work on all facets of cultural planning and event planning and everything. Yeah, it's a one-stop shop. Yeah. And, oh, and so before I, I ask you about Create Victoria a little bit, uh, I think a lot of people would like to know how they become a, a, a senior cultural planner, because you were telling me, yeah, it's not a straight <laughs> journey to the goal line here. And I, I think that other yeah. people might be inspired by your story. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I feel for young emerging arts 
managers and uh, people who are looking into this field only because there isn't like a straight path. Like if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, you, you sort of know the steps you need to take. You can kind of check all the boxes and get there. Um, when you look at the fields of senior uh, management roles in arts and culture, there isn't that straight line to get there. Um, you know, and I started, you know, $8 an hour interning, you know, working my way through arts organizations from the very bottom to the top and really showing up and, and not being afraid of like digging in and working long hours and being paid very little. Um, and just, I stuck with it though. Um, I kept, you know, I, I just, I loved the work and I love working with creative people. Um, so I worked through the nonprofit um, sector for quite a bit of, quite a few years and also had the education, uh, which is key. So you need both. Um, yeah. I think sometimes you can fall into that trap of too much academics and not enough of that practical work because once you get into these jobs, you realize it's a lot of the the practical day-to-day -day work that they don't teach you in, in universities and colleges. They're still very critical to have that theoretical knowledge, but you still need that practical day-to-day -day knowledge. And so, yeah, I was very lucky. It's it's also about networking and connecting and, and knowing people so that when those you know, your, the opportunities um, and luck, I think, is a, is a big key in terms of being ready when those opportunities do open up and then really sh proving to those people around you that you can deliver, even though sometimes you're terrified. <laughs> um, often I've been terrified in my career. I'm like, this is way outside my comfort zone, but that's when you're learning. That's when you're growing. And I've done that over and over and over my career. I've just stepped up when, um, when I've had to and, and figured it out. And I have a great network of colleagues from across the country through Creative City Network and other organizations where I can lean on them and, and, and vice versa. Um, and so, yeah, um, it hasn't been a, a straight route. It's sort of uh, been a 20 year adventure, I would say. And uh, uh, I was very fortunate to get this burn low, um, sort of temporary position. It was auxiliary, but I was able to prove myself and I got things happen in Victoria. You did. Yes, sorry, breaking up a little bit there <laughs> at the end, but that's okay. I think we got the message. It's uh, it's basically you're saying strong education, also uh, networking is a big thing. Luck is a great part of it, but really what you talked about is kind of hard work. You've spent 20 years in the trenches working through lots of different sectors, lots of different um, areas within the arts. So I think you've really earned your stripes. And I think people should know that it takes a diverse background to become a senior cultural planner with a big um, uh, organization like the city of Victoria. I think that's pretty fair to say, right? <laughs> I think it may be fair to say, it may not be fair to hear. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> can you hear me, Nicola? I did mention from the top, we had a few technical problems, but uh, can you hear I me can. now? We're, come, we're kind of come to improvise. Yeah, we will have to improvise. Um, anyway, we'll keep going. Uh, Nicola, <laughs> if you can hear me and if it <laughs> comes through okay, uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about Create Victoria at this point, your sort of five-year master plan to um, revolutionize arts and culture in the city. Can you, can you speak to that and can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So the yes, Create Victoria was uh, it actually just recently passed December of 2017 uh, at City Council. Um, so we had our marching orders from City Council back in 2015 to 2018. They have a strategic corporate plan. That's basically like a city's strategic plan uh, in order to the work across the across the organization. And we're one objective um, under a sort of 12 that the city has, and every city has slightly different corporate strategic plans. Um, and in there it said that, that they want to complete a culture plan um, in 2000, before 2018. Uh, we also, in our official community plan, which all communities have, which is legislated by the provincial government, we had that we would undertake a culture plan. And really, um, for those that don't know, it, it's really your strategic plan. It's your roadmap for how you invest in arts and culture and, and heritage. And um, we didn't have one. Um, we were sort of just, uh, we were very reactive in, in some ways. Um, we didn't really have a uh, a long-term view of how we should be um, approaching culture. Oh, 
Okay. I think we've lost you a little bit, Nicola, but uh, we'll probably have you back. So we'll just wait on here for a second. Uh, Patricia, just uh, Patricia Hunter. Turns up. Oh, can you hear me? No. Oh. Sorry, it's just breaking up a little bit still, Nicola. Uh, in the meantime, there, I'll just say that Patricia Hunsrum, uh, Patricia is basically the program curator for the Arts BC Conference, which is sponsoring this particular Facebook Live. Patricia's just put up some information you can see on the screen if you want to go and check out what those guys are doing, uh, victoria.ca. So thanks for that, Patricia. And um, Nicola, can you hear me now? We're still a bit stuck. I don't know why, but we've had a few problems with the connection to Victoria with Nicola. We did a little session yesterday, and we thought we worked out the bugs, but we still we still need to uh, well, we still need to fix a few bugs by the looks of things. But it's actually not with nothing we can do. It's more the internet. Are you back with us, Nicola? I can see you moving. Yes, I can. You can hear me, but I can't really see or hear you. Is that right? And I think we might have lost Nicola, although sometimes this happens and it usually comes back. So I do apologize for that, but we'll have to wait and see if the, the broadcast link reappears. But um, like I was saying, they do have a five-year master plan, and uh, Patricia Huntsman's been down there helping create Victoria develop this program. And it's a really expansive idea. It's about how to rethink and reimagine your city built or uh, city through creative city building and there you're back i refreshed oh that's great you know what that was a really good idea so <laughs> i was just saying <laughs> i was just saying but i was just talking a little bit about the master plan and um you can continue if you want yeah so it um so we hired patricia huntsman uh in january of uh 2016 Dean, I believe it was a, a fabulous process working with Patricia and um, really led the way in terms of process and planning. And we had really ambitious plans in terms of making this um, really an innovative approach to planning and putting creativity in the center of planning. You know, we're talking about culture and creativity and all these amazing artists. Like, why? put that at the center of the whole project plan. So we did, um, and we had a lot of fun sort of creating um, more engaging, creative ways to get people out. I think sometimes with cultural planning, you can, it's the usual suspects and it's a bit cut and dry with surveys and, you know, which are key components of a methodology for cultural planning, but you can also have a lot more fun and, and use creativity to draw more people out as well as um, using creative techniques to get people to provide. Um, feedback and, and uh, engage with people. So we had a lot of fun and worked very hard over the last it was eight months of engagement, assessment, and research. We also worked with Nordicity in terms of an economic impact assessment. Uh, and I think we engaged over 2,000 people um, over those eight months. Uh, and we both did both internal and external engagements. So we really worked with also other departments in City Hall in terms of where does culture sit within their own departments, which is really key um, and sometimes lacking in, in um, other processes. Uh, and we really want to make sure that it was integrated, a real integrated approach to cultural planning uh, throughout City Hall in Victoria. So we did that and really proud of, I have actually have a copy here. Um, and I think Patricia, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, for sure. We can see that. Create Victoria. That's our, that's our master plan. This is now our map and it has a uh, great implementation um, strategy with, so it's not just a plan that sits on a shelf. It's already being implemented. We're well on our way. Um, and it's a great to have this, not only for staff, but the public, the public and the counselors, um, our partners all know where we're heading. They know our short term and long term goals. Um, and this was really based on a creative ecosystem approach. So it's not just the city doing it alone. It's about all of us working together to make this a truly creative city and a place you want to um, live and call home. So we're really proud of it. Yeah, it's great. I actually read through it last night and it is really, it's a very well crafted document. I've got to say hands off to you and to Patricia because it's really detailed and it's a really expansive vision about mm -hmm. creative city building. And I think that's awesome. I want to read something if you don't mind to sure. you and you can react to it. It's something that I read from the, um, from the, the master plan itself. It says, um, what did it say? It says the arts, culture and events office, which is where you're a part of, 
is mm -hmm. to be repositioned as a cultural hub, quote, to roll out the red carpet instead of the red tape and to continue to build its uh, collaborative community partnerships. And I thought that was just an awesome statement. So tell us a little bit about what that means. Oh yeah, and then there's lots in there to, to uh, unfold. One, one is that uh, sometimes, I, and we've heard this, this is what we heard, and so everything I say here is that it was, it's based on what we heard from from the community, and, and sometimes, especially around the, the cultural hub and being a one-stop shop, that they were sort of being sent all around City Hall, for example, if they were starting in uh, a new cultural space and they need to permitting and zoning, and you know, they're going all over the city in order to um, access information or resources. And so um, what we're proposing is a one-stop shop. So if you are, let's say, opening a live music venue and you're going through all of the, the regulations that you need to, to go through to open up that space, your first point of contact would be our office, and we would actually help you navigate um, City Hall through all of those processes because we can be your advocates. We want live music venues. We want more spaces um, that, that provide opportunities for artists and also the public to enjoy, for example, live music. And so uh, sometimes, you know, if, if they just go in cold without any support from, let's say, our office, these things, you know, they can get a lot of red tape. And so we're here to sort of say, where is that red tape? Where can we get rid of it? And also be advocates for those applications coming through um, other through other departments. And so uh, that's just one aspect. And I think to, to add to that, I think that red tape is really uh, a big part of what city governments can do. Like, where is that red tape that is really stopping creativity from flourishing? Mm -hmm. You know, we want to create those conditions for creativity to to happen in our city. This is what the whole plan is about, really. Um, and so where do we need to get out of the way? Sometimes city governments need just to get out of the way, but also where do we then need to lean in and be at the table and support um, the creative sector here? And so uh, you really need to know your role. And I think that was a really great process for us through Create Victoria was what is our role? Um, where are we best um, positioned to help support the community? Um, and I think sometimes you also have to go, um, where are we just getting in the way? Like, where is that regulatory um, red tape, which is just stopping us? And sometimes it's super silly things, little things that can stop, stop progress. And you're thinking, so you're taking that sort of review of policies and bylaws and um, all those old rules that just don't even make sense anymore, and especially in a city like Victoria, which is growing and evolving and um, changing so rapidly, we sort of need to look at those and say, it doesn't work for us anymore. We're not the same city we were three years ago, or it's not the same problems or not the same issues. So you have to keep current. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about this? This is somebody else, something else I read from the plan, and I'd like to get your reaction to this as well. It says, uh, Victoria is a creative city with an evolving cultural identity and narrative. One is the one that is both punk and polite. So <laughs> I wonder what that meant, but I love it. Ah, well, in Victoria but, we have, we, yeah, we have a, a fabulous legacy of heritage conservation and preservation and long-standing histories of uh, of well-established arts organizations and institutions. And we have a lot of our public love little old. Victoria, they love the quaint um, Oceanside uh, community. Um, they want to preserve and protect and not expand and not, um, they like to keep the keep it the way there it is. Um, yeah. There is another group, I would say, of citizens that we heard that said, you know, we're, we're, uh, we've got this new tech sector. Um, we want to be, you know, really innovative. We want growth. We want development. Um, we want more, um, you know, just, uh, an edgier sort of city and, and we want progress and you know we don't want sleepy sleepy old Victoria anymore we really want to uh, shake it up and so we sort of have these two these two groups that sort of sometimes seem to battle it out uh, when on certain things and um, but they're both they're both valid and they're both part of our community so I don't think it's either or I think it's how do we work together how do we celebrate the punk and the polite and how do we all work together um, in in the city um, because you you need both um, but I think right now we, when we were doing the cultural plan, we sort of um, we came we came up against that, and it's a negative. I think it's it's a positive, um, and it's something unique to our city. It's something that makes us authentic, um, and so let's build on that rather than sort of let it tear us apart. Um, 
So I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think it was an interesting one. And I, I think Punk and Polite just kind of stuck. Uh, I can't remember who came up with it. It might have been, I can't remember. Maybe Patricia remembers. And maybe it was Luke. I'm not sure. Um, but it was, Luke Ramsey's our artist in resident. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it kind of talks about Victoria in a nutshell that way in terms of what the, the, the identity that's emerging here. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Something else that I was interested about the document, there's a lot of new terms. There's a lot of, lot of new language. And um, mm-hmm. probably for arts admins and um, local community leaders and organizers and people like this, this language is quite common or familiar. I'm referring to things like uh, city making, the creative ecosystem, the creative economy, creative placemaking, cultural hubs and clusters. I'm not going to ask you to define all these words. But... I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> Unless you want to. No. <laughs> but, uh, no, that was a quiz. No, yeah. <laughs> there's a quiz at the end. And that I'll be like flipping through. Wait. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you know what they all are. But um, yeah. what I wanted to know is, are these terms that we're all going to get, we all need to um, get used to and to and to know because they're becoming more commonplace and this is the future? Because I really want to know if this is what you're referring to as the new arts era, because I think it is, right? I think so. Yeah, definitely these terms, um, they can come and go sometimes, but these ones I think have been sticking around for the last, I would say, five, five, ten years, and a lot of it's coming out of, from Europe and what's happening there. Um, and I'm seeing a shift a little bit from, like, creativity for a long time was sort of, it was talked about as a, or more of an adjective, where it's becoming more, uh, I use creativity uh, as much as I use culture. Because I think sometimes with culture, it's a, it's a big word. It's like it's heavy. Like when when it's, when you say heavy. culture to someone, it can have so many different meanings, um, and and part of cultural planning is even just defining what culture is, and, and that can take a long time for our community to really get all get on the same page. Is like what are we talking about when we're talking about culture? I find when you shift the language a little bit to creativity, or create creative, people kind of go, yeah, I think yeah, it's. It, it sits with people, I think, easier than culture. Culture kind of, you, people kind of glaze over. They don't, they all have sort of a different place for 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 what that means to them. Where I find creativity, people are like, okay, yeah, yeah, I get I get that, right? There's yeah, I also place. think there's this, I, I, I also think that there's probably a generation of people who are thinking, what's wrong with the old arts era, you know, as well. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, yes, we're used to these great big size words like culture, and we're just quite fine with them because we can live in our vagueness, you know? Yeah, and I, yeah, I do think it's a new, like you say, um, it is a new arts era. I, you know, I, we're right in the middle of it right now, and even in Victoria, when we talk about punk and polite in terms of how people consume culture. So when you think about, uh, a certain generation, you know, you dress up, you go to the theater, you bought your tickets in advance, you go and sit in a traditional, let's say, proscenium arch theater, um, and you, and you, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of build up to that, and um, you buy your ticket, and it's a whole evening out. Um, I think a younger generation now is sort of always, you know, they're on their, their smartphone devices, and they may download something or a live stream um, watching an opera or a symphony like on their phones, right? I mean, it's a totally different or, you know, what the difference is, is that they can in culture from around the world, you know, that you can, you can access um, culture globally now where there's a, where there was an audience and a generation that, that really uh, it was in their backyard and they would go to the theaters and they would go to the galleries. And it's just changed in terms of how people consume culture now. Um, and I think uh, arts organizations are sort of going through that evolution of audience development and how people do consume culture and using technology in the digital age to reach more audiences. But how do you also keep your traditional audiences who want to sit in the, th- you know, go, go to a physical space and connect face to face and still have those experiences. I'm not saying it's just older generations either. I'm saying I think all communities want those opportunities to connect socially. Um, but you are seeing a shift, I think, especially with the millennials, where they are consuming culture in many different ways now, not not um, necessarily attend, buying a ticket and going to something. Um, they're much more open to different platforms for consuming and also distributing, you know, in terms of artists, how they distribute their work and how do they how they produce their work. It's um, technology is a massive part of how they do that now, especially in the music industry in terms of how they distribute their music. And that's 
that's been a huge change in a very short period of time. So I think cities um, in my position are really learning a lot uh, in terms of the digital age and, the, and this new arts era and, and, and helping to support arts organizations through this change because it is it's quite rapid and it's quite uh, it's quite challenging to get your head wrapped around how how do you keep how do you keep going and how do you sustain yourself as an arts organization or as a creative entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but but something I want to ask you on that note though, which does raise, it's like there's um, a lot of what is happening. It seems with Create Victoria is collaborative or community development oriented. And I'm sort of mm-hmm. curious to know what because I think there's probably a lot of people out there who are think, thinking about the artist as an outsider and who may not want to collaborate and and who may not be up for a hub or a cluster mm-hmm. or a creative economy. Right. And I'm just wondering if there's a place for those people or how those people will have to learn to adjust or how, you know, is, is, is that something they're going to have to learn? Yeah. That- I think that collaboration is a big word too. That is, is, I mean, everyone's talking about you really need to collaborate. You need to network. You need to, um, you know, these are the key, key um, aspects of sustaining yourself in this new arts era. And I think, um, it's true, but it's, it doesn't come naturally to a lot of people. And what does that collaboration look like? If all partners aren't getting what they need out of that collaboration, it can actually create a lot of ongoing issues for between organizations or between people. If that collaboration isn't really understood or if one end isn't getting what the other, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of interpersonal relationships and skill building to, to be able to do great collaborative work. Collaborative work. Um, so I don't think it's for everyone, um, but at the same time, I think you still need those really strong networks, whether that's the face-to-face or uh, uh, networks globally where you can sort of connect to your, if you're an artist, your product, idea, service to global markets. And I think in this new arts era, era you need to be tapping into those global networks to be able to get your, your especially in Victoria, we're on an island So your audiences are often not on the island. You're often working with people um, at a distance. And so you really uh, have to uh, think more strategically, I think, about who is your audience and how do you reach them? And they might not be in your community. Um, So yeah, I think it's interesting. I think marketing and audience development is a big part of of this evolution. And and, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity though. I think Canadian, uh, artists and content is very highly sought after and it's pretty exciting news coming out of Canadian Heritage and Minister Jolie's uh, Creative Canada and what's happening in terms of Canada expor- um, exports and, and trying to really improve markets for Canadian artists so I think that's really exciting news um, and yeah and I, I and I think um, I, th- I think there's more opportunity than there are um, Deficit. you know sort of threats to Canadian artists right now, I, I would hope. I think uh, one of our, our big one, obviously in Victoria's affordability, and I think other cities are facing that as well for artists. Um, uh, so, but that's another topic. <laughs> no, I, maybe we'll mention it towards the end because I do want to know what artists think about creative, uh, Create Victoria as well. But I, I think it's, um, I think something that maybe other arts communities would want to know is how they could take the Create Victoria model and apply it to their communities, or do you think they need to come up with strategies that fit with whatever the identity of their community is? Because you mentioned a second ago that you're on the tip of the island, you're, you've kind of got a, a very well-defined location. Mm-hmm. Perhaps somebody like North Van or, or, or Richmond that's part of a, a more metropolitan area, can, can they adopt these kinds of strategies too? And how yeah, do they do I, it? I would say every city needs a culture plan, a culture strategy, a master plan, whatever you want to call it. You need a you need a roadmap. Um, it's so important for a city to value culture with within their municipality or within their community because it's why people move to cities or why people want to stay in their cities or invest in their cities. Like the cultural lifeblood of the city um, can't be under you know understated. Like it, it is. As, as important as environmental or uh, social policy, it's up there as a pillar of sustainability for, for cities. Um, and the great cities you go to, you you know, most people are seeking out those great cities that have great cultural life. And um, and so I think it's really critical. I would say that you can't just then plunk Create Victoria into Create 
a Crate North fan, I think you really need to know your city and it has to be authentic and um, to your city and what works. Every city has its cultural assets, um, what, what you know, a, a strong legacy of what has worked in your city and, and what you have. So you have to use what you have. What are the resources, the cultural resources that exist in your community? And how do you leverage those assets then in terms of your civic goals? Um, and, you know, in, in Victoria, for example, we're on an island, we're on the West Coast, we have a mild climate. Um, we're also a capital city, um, you know. There's so there, and you know we have a strong um, uh, relationship with our Lepungan people, and um, continue to to value and and make sure that um, we are um, on the path of path of truth and reconciliation. I mean that is really key. And so we're at a different place, for example, on truth and reconciliation. Let's say then. Edmonton or Winnipeg, like we're all in different places in terms of our cultural development. So it's important that you do the assessment and you know your city uh, and, and, and work with what you've got um, so that it works for your, you don't want to start plunking down our, our plan somewhere else because it might not work there and you might not need what we need. Like we have very different needs than, for example, a, a, a Toronto you know, or a, a Halifax. We often get compared to Halifax, and I was just there for the Creative City Summit. Beautiful city, amazing, um, but we're different. We're we're just different places. So um, I think it's important to be authentic and really listen to your community, not just try and think, oh, this is what it needs. Your community, you need to engage your community in it, and it's a big part of planning and the work we do. Okay, that's great. So, um, Nicola, you know what? We're almost out of time, but uh, I, want, I do want to talk about creative city building just at the end because remember I said to you yesterday, there is um, we want a conversation starter from you, something that will okay. give the opportunity to explore some ideas that you think we need to be thinking about and talking about amongst each other. You had a good one yesterday. I don't know if you're going to do that one. Okay, I'll do it. Sure. Uh, so I was thinking about this last night want? in bed at three o'clock in the morning, but I thought, you know, this, this it's good. So what, when we were um, engaging the public early on in Creative Victoria, we started with a really broad statement, and it was, what does a creative city look like? And I think it was a great question. It got people thinking. But I think to go beyond that, what I think, and more importantly, what does a creative city feel like? What kind of emotions does it evoke? So when you think about a creative city, your own city, um, what were your, you know, what, what are the, what does that feel like? Do you feel connected? Does that feel like creativity is around every corner? Do you, do you experience everyday creativity in your city? And do you feel like you have the freedom to be creative um, and that there is home for that? So I think um, it, it, to get people thinking, how do you think about your own city and, and what um, emo, uh, sort of emotions that evokes at, from a cultural lens or from a creative lens? Um, and it can be a really fun exercise. And all, and then, so what is the good and what is the bad of that, you know? And, and then what is your place in all of that? How can you either make it better? You know, how can you make it better? How can you make it more creative and, and make the city um, the place where you do want to call home, whether that's as an artist or someone who uh, is a patron of the arts? Um, how, what's your place? What's your role? Because we all have a role to play in, in building creative cities. It's not just the city's role or the arts organization's role or the artist's role, we all have to play a part in this creative ecosystem. We're all interconnected. Um, and so my question is, what does a creative city look like? And and what and more importantly, what does it feel like? Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. That, what that's does a creative city look like? Yes, I love that. Uh, and because you did so well, I'm going to give you a bonus because you did oh. say to me, you okay. were, you did say to me yesterday, you'd love to talk about, uh, is it the Creative City Festival? It's the Creative City Network. So, uh, uh, yes. Network. Sorry, I'm going to give you two minutes on that just because uh, okay. I know you want. Well, no, I really appreciate it. And I, and I mentioned it yesterday um, when we were chatting because it is such a fabulous resource, especially for local governments, but also the arts organizations and artists and everyone, arts councils, who often work on behalf of the municipality to deliver cultural services in that community and town and, and, and uh, some villages and, and all shapes and sizes. Um, so the Creative City Network of Canada, we've been around for just over 15 years. We have an annual summit, which will be in Mississauga this year um, in November 6th to 8th. Uh, I I'm on the board. I was president. I'm now past president. And if you go to the website, uh, Creative 
city.ca. There's a great um, list of resources um, that's available, and it, there's a list serve so you can connect with um, practitioners working in culture across the country. Um, you can ask really great questions, and there's no bad questions because often people are like, oh, I want to know the same thing, but I was afraid to ask. Um, because often, you know, there's no guidebook often on on um, when you're dealing with a council who wants to do something and I'm not sure how to, you know, what's that staff report look like? It's comp it's complex work we work in. Um, and uh, it's great to have a group of colleagues from across the country. So it's all around professional development and learning and knowledge sharing um, from across the country uh, with, uh, with local governments and, and also arts, artists and arts organizations. Um, and so I just welcome everyone to know about that resource and check it out uh, and connect in with the network. Uh, we're building and growing the network um, because we really want more people, more voices at the table um, so we can all sort of help each other and raise, raise the bar in terms of cultural planning and cultural development in Canada. So it's exciting time for us and uh, I just want more people to get on board so we can continue the conversation together across the country. So well, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about Creative City. Oh, no, it's great. It's awesome. We're happy to be able to have you talk a little bit to us about it. Um, I'm just popping that up on the screen right now. You can see that's Nicola Reddington's session. It's Friday, May the 11th, uh, 1.15 to 2.15. And basically, it's called Creative Ecosystems Approach to uh, Cultural Planning. And you're, of course, going to be doing that with Patricia Huntsman, our very own Patricia. So we're delighted to have you and Patricia come and talk to us a little bit about that. That's fantastic. So, Nicola, thank you so much yeah today we really appreciate you coming and speaking thank to us thank you so much happy birthday i hope you have a great birthday today yes it's true it's my birthday today thank you nicola nicholas is on the 15th of april so back at you yes we'll have to <laughs> have the together birthday in front of you. yes that'll be fun yeah that's right we'll have, we'll have a drink in burnaby uh yes, not no, it'll be alcoholic what am i saying <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll have fun. I really look forward to meeting in person. Same, same for us. Thank you so much, Nicola. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a great Thank day. And thanks to all Bye. of you for watching. We appreciate it. And bye-bye. Right. Thanks 20. for all the comments. Oh, yeah, yeah, 23. That's great. <laughs> bye.